welcome to The Hive Podcast, a show that helps inspire you to pursue your passions and ambitions. My name is Jared Spink and I'm your host. I'm a photographer, videographer, and entrepreneur. Join me as I sit down with other entrepreneurs and creators to learn more about their process, how they built communities around their brands, and the experiences they've had along the way. I hope that these conversations inspire you to pursue your goals. You're listening to The Hive Podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Hive Podcast. Thanks for listening and watching each and every week. I really do appreciate it. This week's guest is a great, great source of knowledge for all of us that use Zoom on a daily, weekly basis, or anytime we use it. Because most of us had never heard of Zoom before March of 2020, and now we use it probably all the time. Well, this week's guest has been using it long before most of us have heard of it. She is a real pro when it comes to creating online courses, webinars, anything you want to use with Zoom and presentations. Let's welcome Kat Mulvihill to the podcast. Hi. Welcome, Kat. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. We were just talking right before we started recording that the algorithm on YouTube is definitely working in your favor as of late because um, you've been popping up on my recommended and I've been hooked ever since because I use Zoom a ton. And so mm -hmm. learning all the ins and outs that it can do more than just like what we're doing here on, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you can kind of see us using Ecamm. Zoom is is sort of like Ecamm, not not exactly, but sort of. And, uh, you know, it's for online chat. I don't know. How would you describe Zoom, Kat? Coming from a professional, how would you describe <laughs> Zoom? Well, really, it's just a virtual meeting place. You know, we can't meet in person, so we can gather together into this this one Zoom room, but it can be leveraged and used in many different ways. And I'm seeing a lot of people use Zoom in all sorts of different ways. But a lot of us are spending hours and hours in these Zoom meetings. And frankly, a lot of them are just draining and it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm on a bit of a mission to eliminate boring Zoom calls. Yes, your channel is all about in, uh, creating engaging and professional online presentations to grab and keep the attention of your audience. And your mission is to elevate the quality of your online workshops, webinars, and teaching so that you can create content and be impactful, which is a fantastic mission. And you definitely do that. Your, your what, what do you cover? Let, let's get in depth on the channel. What do you cover on the channel? You know, that, that's a great mission but how do you accomplish that? Yeah, so when I first started out with this content, I was really focused on teaching people how to leverage the tools and techniques that are available to them to make a higher quality presentation on Zoom because I don't think most people realized that it was actually pretty accessible to do things like adding graphics or animations to your Zoom call, just like you would do an Ecamm, actually bringing that in using the virtual camera. And so I decided that that was going to be my focus. And so early on, I really was focused more on teaching some of these tech tutorials. How do you connect something like Ecamm or OBS into your Zoom call? So that's kind of where I started out. But I also have tips for how do you actually just engage your audience? How do you use the breakout room tools? Is there a lot of little tips and tricks people don't realize? So over the course of the year since January, that's really when I got started with this focus, I've been just kind of seeing what are some of the tools and tips that will make other people's experience, the users on the other end, have a better experience when they're in those Zoom calls. And that's fantastic. It's definitely, it's fantastic. It's definitely needed because we've all seen like those SNL skits with Zoom, right? Like how, you know, no one's wearing pants or like, it's a super unprofessional because everybody was just at home. And it, it really was a joke because sadly enough, like, even though that they made like skits out of that, it was pretty much true. <laughs> yeah. You know, like people just didn't know how to use Zoom. So you're, the content you're creating is definitely needed. Um, so you started in Janu January of 2020 or 2021? 2021. Okay. That's, that's yeah. awesome. Like definitely much needed since we're still kind of like having to use Zoom, you know, at yeah. most of the world still. Um, let's talk about what was your motivation getting started? You kind of dived into it a little bit, but t give me like a peek behind the scenes, what it took to, to really get the channel rocking and rolling in January. Yeah, so I actually started the channel last summer and I was initially focused on other material. So when I 
I used to work at a university. I left my full-time job just over two years ago with the idea of pursuing corporate training and helping people really with understanding themselves better. So I was running sessions with teams and also small group programs with individuals who wanted to learn more about how to work with themselves instead of against themselves. So basically a lot of people who are feeling like they were stuck, I would help them try to understand what was going on and break past those barriers. I, I love that stuff. I still love that stuff. But when everything shut down and we had to go virtual, suddenly what I was doing in person, I had to transition online and I had been doing some stuff online. I was actually a Zoom user and a paid account user long before the shutdown. However, I noticed, okay, now I have to start to address my audiences in a different way. And I really wanted people to have a similar experience that they would have if I were with them in person. So I spent a lot of the early months of our lockdown and shutdown of trying to figure out how do I use the technology? How do I make this more engaging? How do I keep people's attention? Because they are being asked to sit in front of the computer for a while. And what I noticed is as I was running those workshops and I was leading groups on Zoom, at the end of the call, they were spending more time asking me questions about how did you show your slides on the screen like that? Or how did you make your name come across the bottom? They were so fascinated with what I was doing to present and they were less interested in the material I was teaching. So I, that's when I recognized, so it was last fall really, when I saw that there's a really big opportunity, people are interested in learning how to do this. It stands out, it's not the norm because sadly a lot of people are just waiting to be over with this whole Zoom thing and the virtual meetings. And I thought, you know, my current channel, so I'd been putting up content about the Enneagram and the four tendencies and why am I stuck? And it was going nowhere, <laughs> really like as a creator, no traction, my numbers were pretty flat and it was disappointing because I loved talking about that stuff and I loved presenting, but I realized, you know what, this is more timely, this is more important right now, this is, these are the skills people need and I love teaching them and I think I'm good at teaching them. So I kind of put those things together and that's when I pivoted. So I rebranded the entire channel. I got a new website domain, basically overhauled my entire business in January. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> that's great. Like I love that as creators, when you start your channel and I, I preach this all the time, like just get started, get started with a plan, but that plan can evolve over time. It, it can change. And I love that you saw a need and you saw that you weren't gaining traction, but you, you saw a need where you could probably gain traction and you, you pivoted and that you, it's so awesome that you weren't afraid to do that. I think a lot of people feel like they're, they're stuck and it's okay to pivot. You can change your content. Like the channel will grow. And if it's not for certain people that are currently subscribed, like, okay, as long as you're having a passion for it and I, I know we shouldn't say it's about the numbers, but it can be, like you said, disheartening when like, I'm, I'm passionate about this, but it's not growing. Well, maybe yeah. you, you can be passionate about something else too. And maybe yeah. there's a, there, there's a bigger need. So it's great that you made that pivot. I want to talk about the early days of the channel. So what were the biggest gaps? Um, I mean, there's a lot of gaps. We, we touched already on a few, but what were the biggest gaps that you saw that you needed to address for people that were using online platforms like Zoom? for professional workspaces that needed to be addressed? So I, the biggest thing I wanted to address early on was that I was seeing this pattern of people going into a presentation where they literally just share slides and just talk and they just stare down at the screen and they read off their slides to the rest of the room. And I thought, really, <laughs> is this, we could do better than this. You know, if we were in person and someone put up their slides and just turned towards the screen and read them off, which I have seen people do, but we generally don't put up with that. And it's well known that you want to address the audience. You want to make sure you're making a connection and that you're not just reading the stuff that you put on your slides. So that was one of the biggest things is, you know, what are some other ways that we can engage and interact with people and also make it more visually appealing, but also support learners. Because if you think about this Zoom platform, a lot of it is not very supportive for a more visual learner or even a hands-on learner. It really tends more towards that auditory learner. So I think if you're trying to really drive home some key points, you want people to take something away from what you're doing and why you've gathered there together for that meeting or webinar or workshop, you really want to think of how can I use multiple tools and techniques 
so that I'm addressing a broad audience as well. So it does really hit a few things. You're keeping attention, you're making it more interesting, more visually appealing. Instead of draining people, they actually might leave feeling re regenerated and rejuvenated and maybe excited about what's next. But in order to do that, it takes a little bit more prep on the front end. I think there's a lot of lazy Zoom users. There really is. <laughs> there there yeah. is. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we've we may have used it as a little bit of a crutch to to not put as much effort into something as we would have maybe if we were in person. But I love that you touched on that. It's the techniques and tools, right? They really go hand in hand. You can have technique, but if your presentation is not engaging on Zoom, you're not going to hold attention. Or if your presentation is engaging, but your technique is lacking, you know, it's going to have the same outcome. So I love that you touch on both, which is, I think, fantastic. So let's talk about the tools um, because I'm a little bit of a, a, a you know, gear geek and, and how you get stuff done. So let's talk about tools. What are some of the, the best tools that people can use to easily up their online presentation uh, skills on Zoom? So my my favorite as far as the visual aspect is to use something like Ecamm. That is my go to. I love that I can set up different scenes. I can have a combination of slides and lower thirds and graphics call to action. I love it. And when people see it, it really, really does stand out. But what you said is a really important point is sometimes people get so caught up in the tools part that they forget to even just focus on some of the most important parts, which is actually have some energy, not realizing that the camera steals some of your energy. So you think you sound interested in what you're talking about, but everyone else just hears you sounding kind of flat and disinterested and dull. So actually looking at, am I coming across as engaged? Am I looking at the camera? That is a big thing that I'm constantly driving home. So I would say my favorite thing, definitely bringing in Ecamm and using the virtual camera. Now there are some some things to know about when it comes to zoom resolution and there are some barriers but i also really want to drive home that you need to not leave behind some of those essentials when it comes to just speaking to a group and making eye contact and upping your energy are two of the simplest things you can start doing right away in any meeting yes they might make you feel uncomfortable but they're really critical and then also be looking at okay how do i up level what i'm trying to do and i'm also not against a traditional screen share or sharing your slides, you can still do a great job and you can still engage a group. But I think people just use it as a crutch a lot. So, yeah. and just yeah. like any presentation, right? There's a time and a place for it. You know, if you, yeah. if you wouldn't do it in the workplace or like at a professional presentation or webinar, why would you do it on zoom? So, I mean, you should be just treating it like you were doing it in person and put forth that, that same effort. And that's yeah. why, your channel is fantastic because you show everybody the tools and the techniques on how to take that, maybe that presentation you would have done in person and how to do it online and have it still come across the almost, almost the same way and just as engaging yeah. and, and beneficial. Um, so let, I want to talk about the videos on your channel now, because I find as, as an, as a content creator, I, sometimes the, the videos we enjoy doing the most aren't necessarily the most popular and what the audience wanted. So what has been like the, your most popular video and why do you think that is? So my most, so full disclosure, I don't look at my stats very often Good. and I don't know if that makes me a bad YouTuber. I just, I, I used to, early on, I used to spend a lot of time looking at them and it wasn't really changing anything. So my, but I am fairly certain that my most popular video is how to use the stream deck for zoom calls, which is a great tool. And I, I love if you have a stream deck, definitely program the hotkeys. I think there's also a stream deck app you can plug in, but I just use the hotkeys so I can quickly mute myself, unmute myself, etc. But that video, the funny thing about that is it was a pretty early on one. It was a live stream which as you are aware, live streams are usually a little bit longer form. And so I do have a number of commenters who just said like, oh, it's too long. And so that is one video that I get sort of the most grumpy comments from people, but I also do get thankful comments, people who appreciate it. And I put chapters in there so someone can kind of jump through and, and get to the part that they want. But I'd say that is the one that probably has the highest. I did, I was recently surprised when 
my significant other was scrolling through YouTube and I saw one of my videos popped up in his recommended feed and I kind of did a double take and thought, oh, that has way more views than I thought. So there, I can't remember exactly which one that was. I think it was the Zoom breakout rooms has been a popular one as well. Yeah, definitely. I would see Zoom breakout rooms being popular because they're they're so useful. And I think a lot of people yeah. don't u- use them to their their fullest extent. So, are most of your videos that you're creating are they pre recorded or are you doing mostly live or is it a, a fairly even mix? It is not even. It started out pretty even. I was trying to get a mix of these shorter form tutorials that were a little more succinct, and then doing the live streams. But because the the pivot that I made with my business, it was a smart one, but it did mean that I was kind of picking up more work. I was getting busier working with clients. And so I found that the live stream was the best way to sort of manage the channel and my sanity. And I do love the live stream format. I've really enjoyed getting to interact with the regulars who will show up to the stream. And so I kind of love that live stream. There are times, however, when it probably would be better suited to have a recorded tutorial where it's a little bit tighter and people can just get in there, get what they want and get out. So I have to figure out a way to sort of manage that because time-wise, I find a live stream easier to manage from a week to week basis versus having the time to put together an edited video. Although I also tend to be a, I think someone calls it live to drive. So I'm like a one and done. I record it like a live stream and then just watch it back once. If it's okay, I ship it. And maybe in some magical future where I feel like I have more time to put into editing and B-roll and all of that, perhaps I'll go there. But for now, this is what I need to just get by as a content creator without losing my mind. (laughs) I absolutely feel you on that because I would love to make more like just to the point videos. I mean, they do do a they do better, you know, but yeah. the, the live stream is just so much easier to be able to put out consistent content. But I've like, yeah. I get it. Like the, the stream deck, like I'm using here probably would have done better as a short form video and just getting to the point, right. Th- than a live stream. Yeah. But sometimes you just don't like live streams take, l- you still got to prep, but they take less time to produce than yeah. once you're all set up than actually recording a video. And I do the same thing when I'm recording pre-recording videos. I use Ecamm to record even mm-hmm. my regular videos. And yeah. I have like the ATEM uh, mini and like multiple cameras and I'll just cut in between and like you cut live. There's a lot less editing to do when you can do all that. So that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Tell me about your business. So it is the YouTube channel basically an extent or a, like a marketing arm or kind of just, is it all kind of one one piece or do you treat the YouTube channel kind of as its own thing and then the business or do they go hand in hand? That's a great question. So I do, I am what I call a multi-passionate entrepreneur. So I would say it is a big part of it. As far as what I do and my business, it is a representation. I'm really just trying to put valuable content out there to my ideal audience and try to serve them. One of my main products, I guess you could say, is that I have a course. So in the in the spring, I was running some live training that people could sign up for, and we would go through all of this stuff together. I then created a self-study course that people can take so they can watch the lessons at their own pace. And then I supplement that with some live question and answers for my students. So that is directly related. The stuff on my YouTube channel is very much connected to the content that I teach in my courses and my live training. I also, though, do other other work. So I'm working with a couple of clients. Um, One is on sort of a project where we're launching a community. So it's stuff I'm really interested in, but it wouldn't be directly connected to what I do. And then I'm also doing some work on Notion. I'm a huge Notion nerd and a Notion ambassador. So I'm actually doing some client work on that end as well. And then I also will do workshops here and there. I was doing one-on-one clients for a while, helping them with their setup. I would work with them on Ecamm or their teleprompter and get all of that but time-wise, it just started to all become a little bit too much. So I've stepped away from the one-to-one consults, uh, but I am still working with, you know, I've got a couple of workshops coming up for some companies where we're going to actually do some skills building for Zoom meetings. So how do you, how are you more engaging with your clients and the people that you're working with? So it's kind of a, a variety of things, but it's all stuff that I love doing, which is yeah. a perk of being an entrepreneur, but managing it all on a, a team of one can be, can be a challenge at times. Absolutely. It can be. So the reason I ask is because, you know, I look at like the content I make and produce 
And a lot of it is around just cameras and videography and, and all the stuff that I'm, I'm passionate about. Right. But it's not necessarily related to what I'm doing for work. I, I do do videography for work. I do photography for work, but it's mostly real estate stuff. And I don't really incorporate that into my channel. So that's why I was wondering, does what you do for your business sometimes impact like what you're the content you're going to create for your channel? I would say so, uh, so because definitely the work that I'm doing with people who are interested in leveling up their presentations, that will inform what content I should make and mm -hmm. like what people want to see. So it definitely has that connection. I think one of the challenges as a creator who is multi-passionate is how do you have it so that you're consistent and predictable. So if someone comes to your channel, you don't suddenly have you know, a video about knitting or something in the middle of a presentations channel. However, I do like the idea of incorporating some of the things that I'm interested in. And so one of those areas is Notion. I love talking about Notion, I love teaching Notion, but it doesn't always fit. So I've tried to find creative ways to pull in Notion into presenting. For example, how do you use a free Notion account to create a resource page for breakout rooms when you're hosting a workshop or a meeting? Or how do you use it to plan your presentations or workshops. I have one coming up where we're going to talk about how do you get workshop feedback, or maybe if you want to send out a form in advance to people who are going to be attending one of your presentations or workshops using Notion to do that. So I try and find creative ways to bring in some of the other things that I'm interested in into my channel content. Yeah, I've noticed that. I'm looking at your channel now and that you've you've created some content around Notion. I think that that's, yeah. that's cool to incorporate stuff you're passionate about into your channel because as a creator, it helps you keep your sanity. So whatever your channel is about, you can you yeah. incorporate what you're passionate about. Um, so get, give me the, give me the, the spiel on, on notion. How, how has that been effective for you and, or for someone planning online meetings? Cause I, I don't know a, a ton about it. Um, I yeah. use Milanote for like planning videos. Is it very similar or is it, is it completely different? I have never heard of that until this moment, so I cannot compare, okay. but wow. I, <laughs> I do use, I use Notion to run my entire business. I use it to organize and plan all of my YouTube content. I use it to plan all of my workshops. It's, it's considered an all in one workplace and okay. the, the, both the pro and the potential con is that it is very customizable. So you get a blank space and you get to create, okay, how am I going to organize myself? And so I love the customizability and that you can sort of create your own workspace, make it work for you. But I think for other people that's daunting and sometimes it might be better just to have something that's done for you. Now there are templates that you can get and something that I did on purpose because I knew it could be overwhelming is I created a series, I think it was in May, every Saturday I did a live stream focused on how I use Notion for content creation and then actually walked people. It was like a build with me series where if you follow along, you can actually build your own workspace as well and customize it and kind of make it look the way that you want and use that for organizing your YouTube channel or your content, depending on what it is that you actually do as a content creator. Uh, that sounds awesome. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. You got to go check out Milano though. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very similar. You can create boards and, and, and create, you know, just very similar stuff to help you plan what yeah. you're doing. Um, so I love to ask everybody that's on the show because everybody I have on is a content creator and an entrepreneur. Uh, what have been the struggles? Cause we all face them. It's difficult to grow a channel. It's difficult to grow a business and to just juggle it all. So what have been some of your biggest challenges and, but how have you found a way through those challenges? I would say one of the biggest challenges is that I always feel like I'm disappointing people. And early on in my entrepreneurship journey, when I had a bit more time because I was just kind of figuring out, I was just starting to get into things. I would be spending a lot of time in communities online with other entrepreneurs, other content creators, and I absolutely loved it. And then as things started to get some traction and to go well, and I was afforded more opportunities, people are reaching out to you, wanting to work with you. And so you get busier and then all of a sudden, all of those communities that you were maybe an active member of, you can't be there as much. And so you feel, I, I personally feel some guilt. I miss that connection and that relationship building the way that I did before. And then also 
when it comes to managing your time, you have to become more discerning. And what I found, and it was a valuable lesson, people were reaching out to me, I think it was in the in the spring where really I was getting a lot of traction, a lot more communication and email and people wanting to work with me. And they would write these really sweet, kind emails about what a difference my content has made. I've helped them so much. And then can I do X? And I had to say no to these people. And I initially felt a lot of pressure to say yes, because they were being so nice to me. And and then I realized, okay, no, flattery does not mean that you owe anything to anyone. So it's amazing that you've made an impact. It's absolutely incredible that these people are getting value from your content and your channel. But if you don't have the bandwidth, you have to say no and you have to respect your boundaries. And that has been one of the hardest things because then what happens when you respect your own boundaries to try and keep yourself sane, you're going to upset people. And that has been one of the biggest challenges I have found. And it's like a blessing and a curse. You know, you're you're doing something right. It's resonating with people and then people are reaching out to you and then you're disappointing those same people. And so that's been, it's an ongoing challenge. I'm getting better at my boundaries but I still feel bad every single time I have to say, no, I don't have any bandwidth to do that. And it kind of just hurts my heart every single time, but I am trying to get better boundaries because I was actually finding, I was starting to lean a little bit more towards burnout and I'm learning more about how to respect my energy and make sure that I'm okay because saying yes to too many things is just going to stretch you too thin and that's not sustainable. That's great. That's, I mean, that's great advice. I, I love that because it's probably one of the f- first times I've actually heard someone say that and admit to it on, on the show. And we've been doing this for, you know, like well over a year. And it's so true. You know, you, you as we're our own worst boss, right? Like when you have, when you work for a company and your boss asks you to work overtime or something, and if you're tired or you got other plans, you say, you say no, like, no, I got, I got other things to do. But when it comes to working for ourselves, we say yes to so much and it really does lead to burnout. And so you got to learn yeah. how to manage that. You got to learn how to say no, it's, it's okay. And if you feel really bad about saying no, you could just say not at this, not at the moment, but yeah. follow back up. Right. Because yeah. you know, you never want to close doors. You, you, there could be other opportunities. So not saying no, doesn't mean no right now. You know, you, mm-hmm. could, you could push it off for the future, but yeah. it, it's, it's such good advice that we got to learn how to balance our time and, I mean, we got it. You got almost have, you have to schedule downtime for yourself when you're self-employed yes. and as a creator, you absolutely have to. I find myself making that same mistake. Uh, just like last month I was working and I think I had, I, I had, you know, photo and video shoots every day straight for three weeks and like, Oh wow. That's a lot. You, just, you start losing your mind a little bit because like, yeah. especially with real estate stuff, you got to turn it around like next day. So you're shooting a ton, you're going, going home, working late, editing. Yeah. Like, got to find balance guys. Yes. I've enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you for your time. I hope that all the listeners are left wanting to learn more about you and your content. Um, So make sure you guys go check out uh, Kat's channel. Be linked down in the the show notes on YouTube or the, or the description of the video on YouTube and the show notes in your favorite podcast player. So Kat, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Well, guys, like I said, if you want to learn more about online presentations and how to really up your skills and the tools needed to do so, make sure you go check out Kat's channel. It really is great. It's a great resource. So make sure you go subscribe and just bookmark it. And that way, anytime you have a presentation, you can, you know, go get a little refresher course on Kat's channel. Well, as always, I appreciate you guys listening and watching each and every week. If you enjoyed it and you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe so you don't miss miss future episodes and leave a five-star rating if you're listening in the Apple podcast player. And hey, if you guys haven't gone to uh, get yourself a Hive podcast shirt, it'll be linked down in the description of the podcast. So go check out the shirts. All right, guys, I'll talk to you next week.